Thank you, Anders, for the introduction. Um, hey, Malmo. Um, I'm a human rights researcher, and I run a small organization called the Localization Lab. We provide uh, ethnographic research, we provide usability feedback and localization, of course, to so-called human rights technology. So, uh, privacy tools, circumvention tools, a whistleblowing platform, uh, citizen reporting tools. I've also spent a better part of the past five or six years, uh, including in graduate school, researching refugee rights and access to services. And I started my own project, uh, a platform for information sharing and communications for refugees and asylum seekers. I'm going to share with you today some of the big lessons I've learned um, from the human rights projects that we support at Localization Lab, both uh, the big wins and the colossal failures of some of the projects, and some of how we're applying them in building the platform. One of the first questions I ask when we have a new project come on board is, tell me about your end user. Where do they live? What do they do? Do they have internet at home? Do they use a cell phone? Um, tell me about their day and tell me which part of their life does your project come in? Then I ask them, usually developers or project owners, to, to tell me, all right, so from the concept stage through development to testing, where have you consulted with this end user, this person who, who life you're so familiar with? And the answer is pretty disappointing, usually. It's, uh, well, we haven't yet because it's not finished yet. Um, which, if you're not working with your end user really from the concept stage, you are doing it wrong and you are making my life more difficult when it gets to the localization stage. The platform which we're building, um, in whichever shape it takes form, whether it's an app or a website um, or a non-tech solution, is going to be built with a team of refugees and asylum seekers who have come to Europe in the past 12 months. Um, while I am a refugee myself, I don't know what it's like to to walk across the continent of Europe. I don't know what it's like to travel with two small children. I don't know what it's like to get into a boat knowing that I can't swim, armed with nothing but a cell phone and, uh, and my life vest. There are so many, to, sorry to quote Donald Rumsfeld, but known unknowns <laughs> when it comes to designing this. That was not my plan to quote him. <laughs> Um, I need a diverse group of experts, people who have gone through this trip, people who know this better than I do. Um, in this case, it's, it's people who have fled. Um, you might be shaking your head like, of course, this makes perfect sense to use your end users to, to build tools that are for them. But it's, it's really astounding how few projects actually go with that mindset. Another, another big benefit um, is first-hand access to these communities. You're tapping into already existing trust circles to communication networks. Um, there are Facebook groups in Arabic and Farsi that have all this information on there. The information exists. People are already meeting up somewhere to, to share which smugglers do we trust? How do we get from one point to the next? Or, I've, I, my son is missing, we haven't heard from him in weeks. Here's his picture. This is really all happening um, on, on Facebook, largely, and in, in, in WhatsApp groups as well, um, which is why it's important to go to them in these Facebook groups. I have yet to see in any of, and I've been monitoring them, I think, since January or February, I have yet to see UNHCR or many of the larger NGOs advertise where the people are, not physically, but digitally. The big, big problem, of course, is that they're not archived or organized well, which still leaves that large information gap. On the right here is Aris Vlahopoulos, who is a local um, on the island of Lesbos. He's with the organization United Rescue. 
So what Otis did is he did it right. He went to people both physically and in Turkey by writing his phone number in Arabic and Farsi and telling people, send me your GPS location and every 10 minutes send it to me so we know where you are, so you'll be safe. If there is an emergency, if there is a rainstorm, uh, send it every two minutes and, and keep sending it and don't lose contact. And uh, Aris has had zero casualties using this system. He's also advertised on these community groups. He, he did it right. He, he knows to study a community before you develop a new system and to be on their terms. It has to be on their terms. You're going to have to... Oops. You're going to have to study the social structures of the community that you're going to be working with. Um, and this means... Whoever you trust online, you're going to be trust, you will trust in person. Whoever you care about, to whomever you're accountable to in person, you will be so online as well. You wouldn't trust a, tr a stranger you meet online more than you, you would in person. Um, you have to pay attention also to, are there distinct women's and men's physical spaces that are separate? Are there marginalized groups that are left out of uh, the information loop, out of decision making? This is all going to have to play a big effect place in designing your project. Um, whichever project it is. And if this seems intimidating, it doesn't have to be. Because hopefully by this point, you're working with your end users who are providing this information to you. A really good example of a successful project is the Red Hook Initiative, um, where, has anyone heard of the Red Hook Initiative in Hurricane Sandy? All right, a few. Um, where technology mirrors real-life social networks. Um, a mesh network project, which was started a couple of months before Hurricane Sandy hit. So Red Hook is a neighborhood in Brooklyn, which is surrounded by water. It was hit pretty heavily in Hurricane Sandy. Um, mesh networks allow for peer-to-peer uh, -peer communications, which is why when, when power and, uh, and telecom went down after the hurricane, people stayed connected. People who were accountable to each other in person were accountable to each other using this platform, sending messages that we need medical attention, or there are elderly that need help that live on the 11th floor who can't use a lift to go down. They need water. Or I have electricity, finally, if anybody wants to come to recharge their phones. This worked so well because this is an existing community. This is a network of people who already trust each other, who see each other face to face, and, uh, and they say New Yorkers are rude. But really, the hero is never the technology. The hero is always the people. It's just a matter of finding the right technology that mimics those interactions. Something I noticed in Greece um, in the past few weeks, and actually while working at the UN too, is the sitraps or situation reports are written in English and French only. Um, sometimes we'll get lucky and get some Arabic press releases because Arabic is one of the six languages of the UN, but largely it's, it's English and French and sending such a clear community, you know, message to the community again that your human rights are not your business, they're our business. And you don't need to know what's happening to you. You don't need to know if there is more aid coming to you in the next month. Uh, of course, when you bring this up, oftentimes the answer is, well, why, why would they need to know this? Yes, why would they need to know what's, what's the, you know, the emergency in their refugee camp where they've lived for a year or five or 20? Um, this is alienating people so much, and it's, it, what it does is it makes you really a non-human. It, or it infantilizes you that you're entirely relied, relying on other people for this, for this information. And just to illustrate that, um, there's a big lack of translators in the camps in Moria and Karatepe and other parts of Greece that I've noticed. Um, 
who speak more than Arabic, right? They speak Tigriya, they speak Dinka, they speak Somali. Refugees are coming from all over, not just Syria and Iraq. Um, and we don't want to alienate them. We want them to feel empowered. We want them to feel like they can express their opinion. They want them to be able to ask when there's a pediatrician coming, when they can, when they can see a gynecologist, when what's happening to them. They deserve to know what's happening to them, which is also, I think, the most common question I got in Greece. Um, what's going to happen to us next? And it's, it's a bit... It's a bit sad because everyone that I've interviewed, from the Greek government to the UN to NGOs to a whole like diverse group of refugees um, around Athens and in Lesbos, no one seems to know what's going to happen next, especially since the EU-Turkey deal. I put this quote in because I think it's just represents so succinctly and so well the communication needs and the information gap. Um, when it comes to, to, to refugees and how they're treated. Most of them, if they had any extra money, would buy a cell phone, more credit, or a SIM card. Uh, this was one of the volunteer translators on Lesbos. And uh, I'm sure you've seen this at some point last year. On Twitter, people were saying, yeah, well, if they're really refugees and not economic migrants, why do they have a cell phone? Why do they have a smartphone? And a really clever response was, you know they're escaping war, right? Not the 16th century. Like, it's, everyone has a cell phone, especially if you're traveling around places where you don't speak the language in unknown territory with, with kids. Um, you, you absolutely need one. You need one because it, where there's no information coming from you one, um, or other officials, it, it, it leaves a lot of space for, for abuse. It leaves a lot of space for rumors, for unrest in the camps. Um, any information that does come tends to flow like a, like a horrible game of telephone that's spread from one person to another, that it can, it can be inaccurate and, and Given the challenging legal and information landscape and all of the multiple stakeholders involved in this, um, in this crisis, it leaves, it leaves these information gaps. Um, it leaves people vulnerable to smugglers and to traffickers because they sneak into camps quite easily and, uh, and they have information and they have a lot of promises to take you somewhere and you have to trust them because there's no one else. Connectedness obviously reduces their already very vulnerable state. Um, and lastly, this is neither the first nor sadly the last refugee crisis we'll deal with. The Dadaab refugee crisis, the Dadaab refugee camp rather, is set to close in Kenya by November. That is, a third of a million people will be left homeless. That is a little bit bigger than the size of the Malmo, uh, who need to know where they're going, who need to know what it means to claim asylum somewhere, who need to know what it means to register with UNHCR, that they can report sexual violence to law enforcement and they won't be returned back to their, uh, to their country as a result. Um, and I added this photo again in the end. Just, like to, just to illustrate, because it's, I took this a couple weeks ago just outside of, it's not Dadab, it's uh, the Elenico camp just outside of Athens. And uh, it's just so sadly symbolic of, of the state right now. It's, it, it should be the thing that comes up if you Google image the word like alienation. But it so quickly is not alienation. That feeling so quickly leaves you when you have the right information, when you feel empowered, when you feel like a human being whose opinion matters, when you have agency, when you feel like a whole human being again. Thank you.